in and sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. <laughs> Teaches reverence, 
And uh, ultimately, uh, you know, when you're reproving a child, when you're correcting a child, you need to direct them towards God also. Uh, you know, that's something that uh, I try to do with my kids is when they get in trouble, I turn it to a spiritual application and show them that they're not just sinning and disobeying me, they're disobeying God. And uh, that teaches them reverence, uh, not just for me, but for God. Yeah. And so the fear of the Lord, the reverence of God, uh, is the beginning of wisdom. And so the rod and reproof give wisdom, teaches them reverence, it teaches them obedience. And so that is very important in our world today. We don't have much of that. Uh, you know, there's... Uh, our society had, for so long has, has uh, you know, been against uh, uh, spanking a child that many people don't do it anymore. And they use bargaining and all these different things to try to, uh, you know, uh, get their kids to do what they want them to. But... It really doesn't teach any respect of others. It doesn't teach any reverence for authority. Uh, it doesn't teach any teach the kid anything that's going to last and make them uh, a, a, a you know a, a humble person or make them someone uh, who is going to be uh, a uh, help to society. And so we see that today, and, and it's our youth that really concerns me. Uh, when I look at our country today, because it's our youth that is, I mean, they're just uh, so far from the truth, and and and, uh, and really the, the parents are to blame. Uh, you know, I, I see it a lot in, in my line of work. Uh, you, you see how uh, the children te uh, treat the parents and how the parents deal with the children. I mean, it's sad. Uh, you know, so many times I want to step in, but I don't. I just hold my hold my tongue and 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 just try to be as patient as I can, understanding that you know it's not the kids' fault; it's the parents' fault. Uh, the parents aren't uh, training up their children the way uh, that they used to, <laughs> and I think that has a big impact on the way our country is headed. Is because. You know, there is no reverence anymore. There is no respect. There is no, uh, you know, uh, treating others as, as uh, you know, you would want to be treated. That golden rule that uh, we, I was taught, and I know older ones were taught uh, in school, of treating others how you want to be treated, you know. I mean, it's just not that way anymore. Yeah. Uh, but that's another part of Satan's plan, amen, to get people away from the Word of God and, 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 and what the Word of God, oh, oh yeah, well that's something that the Word of God says that's, that's uh, uh, not good, you know, uh, you shouldn't spank a child and, and all these kind of things. Well, you know, uh, as, we, as we know here in this church and as, as most Christians know that you you go away from doing what the Bible says and you're, you're getting away from, you know, what God promises in His Word. And so, the Word tells us that you train up a child in the way that he should go and when he's old, he won't depart from it. Uh, but they're not teaching kids anymore. There's, you know, it's just, like I said, it's bargaining. They're bar they bargain with their kids. Well, if you don't do this, we're not going to go to Walmart and get a toy or we're not going to go... To McDonald's and get a Happy Meal, or we're not. I mean, the bargaining thing that's just destroying the kid. I mean, uh, that's not <laughs> it, it's sad to see the way things are. Uh, but uh, you know, I encourage parents, you know, when I hear a parent, you know, tell a child, if you don't straighten up, you're getting a spanking, you know, I try to encourage them, you know. Because there's not that encouragement in our society today. Uh, in fact, people, if you even mention spanking a child, they, uh, you know, grimace or, uh, you know. So it's just sad. But we know the Bible is right. Amen. We know the Word of God is true. Yeah. And that the rod and reproof give wisdom. Uh, 
That if you want, your, if you really love your child, you're going to spank them when they need it. You're going to teach them that there is a consequence to being disobedient, and uh, that there are lines drawn that you don't cross. And so, uh, is it hard? It is hard. You know, as a parent, it is hard to discipline your children because you uh, you don't like that part of. Uh, training them and bringing them up, but yet it is necessary uh, to their development. And if you love them, then you're going to do it. You're going to do it, whether it's hard or not. You're going to do it. Number one, because it's what the Word of God says is right. And number two, you know that because the Word of God is right, uh, that your child is going to be better off for it. Uh, because on the other side of that, a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. And that I see that all the time. Uh, I see parents just, you know, you can see the shame on their face when their kid's acting up and they, you know, they can't control their child. And, you know, threatening them doesn't work or trying to bargain with them doesn't work. Uh, it, it's sad to see that, but that's the way it is. In verse 17, he says, Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. Uh, you know, a spanking <laughs> will straighten up a child real quick. <laughs> uh, you get their attention, right? When I was in school, they still had corporal punishment in school. Elliot, Elliot, straighten up. And they still had corporal punishment in school when I was in school. And they always called the paddle the Board of Education to the Seat of Understanding. Because <laughs> that's what it does. It educates you real quick <laughs> on what is allowed and what is not allowed. And uh, what kind of conduct is expected? So, uh, but again, they don't have that today. So kids are just left to themselves. Uh, you know, you hear stories about children cussing out teachers and, and uh, even fighting teachers, and, and they don't care if they get thrown out of school because their parents aren't going to do anything. In fact, the parents go up to the school and want to fight with the teacher and the principal because they're kicking their kid out of school. Well, they don't want their kid to have to be at home because they don't want to have to deal with them. You know, they want them to go to school so they get that time, you know, without their kid, they don't have to worry about it. I mean, that's how parents are today. They don't care. When I was a kid, if I got a spanking at school, I got home and I got home. And so... You know, that's not that way anymore. But if you want your son, and you want your children to be a delight, you want them to be uh, someone that you want to be around, which is sad. Most parents don't want to be around their children. And they don't uh, care enough to <laughs> correct them the right way. And so they just pawn their kids off or tell their kids to go you know, and, and the kids left to raise themselves. It's sad. Uh, verse 21 says, He that delicately bringeth up his servant from a child shall have him become his son at length. And you say, well, what does that have to do with, with training a child? You know, anyone can be a dad. Uh, you know, a father, I guess. That's the saying. Anyone can be a father, but it takes, you know, someone who cares to be a dad. And it doesn't matter who it is, if it's not your child or what, if you show interest in that child and show them that you really care about them, even if you have even if that is through discipline, you're going to you're going to win that kid. I mean it's it's seriously there's a difference when you see the kid and how they act when they know that people don't care. And how then that changes how they act when they know someone really cares. And that's really what we have to do is show them that we care. <laughs> you know, whether it's our kid or not. And I try to, to do that at work, you know, um, to, to, you know, if a kid's acting up or whatever, 
you know, and the parent's not going to do anything about it, I, I try to talk to the kid and say, listen, this is not, you know, you need to straighten up right now. And uh, if, if they don't think anyone cares, then they're going to act out. But if they know someone cares, and that's the whole thing, it's just because even if it's, in this case, a servant, you know, uh, someone who cares about that person, and that individual, and invest uh, themselves in that individual, it's going to pay uh, dividends. It's going to show in that person's life that somebody cared for them. And you go to prisons and you can find people all over the place that nobody cared about. You know, and they raise themselves and, and you know, whatever. And, and now they're in prison because their life went away that, uh, you know, it shouldn't have gone. If people would have invested time in that person's life to truly care about them and train them and, and correct them and, and uh, teach them what's right and what's wrong. Look at Proverbs chapter 22. I think it was Ben Carson who pointed out when he was running for office that it's sad that they won't allow Bibles in schools, but they allow Bibles in prison. Maybe if they allowed Bibles in school, there would be a lot less people in prison. And that's true. Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 6 says, Train up a child in the, child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now that's a promise from God. Amen? Amen? That if we train up a child in the way they should go, that they will not depart from it. When they're old, they're going to understand mom and dad was right. And I tell you what, the older you get, the more you understand yes. that their correction was because they loved you and that they were trying to teach you, you know, that there are consequences in lives, uh, in actions, and the choices you make. Uh, and, and you know what? This world's a lot less forgiving uh, than mom and dad. So uh, that's good to, to have that promise from God's Word. And not just training them up to be a good person, you know, but training them up in the admonition and nurture of the Holy Scriptures so that they can understand because the, the greatest thing that we can give our children is Jesus. Amen? He's the best friend uh, anyone can have. So, verse 15 says, Foolishness is bound in the heart of the child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. And how true is that? You know, I, you know if I'm talking to someone about that, uh, you know, about a sin nature, the child is easy to use because it shows that before they've even really had any training at all, they know to do wrong. <laughs> it is in them. <laughs> No one has to teach them. You know, I thought that was one of the things, me and Angela, if we were naive on anything uh, when we first got married, it was about children. And we thought we saw other people's children and, and, and how they acted sometimes and all these different things. And me and Angela, was, we'd look at each other and we'd be like, man, we're not going to let our kids do that. Our kids aren't going to act like that. Well, hello. <laughs> And we thought, well, it's because they they take their kids to, you know, daycare and they're around other kids and they're learning all this bad stuff. They don't have to be around other kids to learn bad stuff. I mean, they they just learn it. Yeah. It's in them. That sin nature is real. And so you don't have to teach them to do wrong. They, they figure that out all on their own. But you, you do have, to, it does take time and effort to correct them and to teach them what is right. And like I said, that's an investment that is going to pay dividends. That's an investment that is going to come to fruition later in their life. They're going to understand, you know, even if they rebel for a while, they're going to understand, listen, this is something uh, that is right. 
Proverbs chapter 12 and verses 7 through 11 talks about the chastening of the Lord. We all know this, these scriptures. But this, this just teaches us, you know, our example. That chastening comes from love and has to come from love. It's not just, uh, you know, to work out your frustration, <laughs> which some people do that way. It's not just to work out your frustration, but if you love your child, you want them to understand what is right and what is wrong. In the same way with God. He doesn't do it to work out his frustration on us. He doesn't do it because he hates us. He does it because he loves us. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 7 says, If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For verily, uh, for they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. That's a great way to know that we're a child of God, amen, as if He chastens us. If a person can go out and live in sin and, and do all that kind of stuff and they have no conviction on their life and God's not dealing with them, Something's wrong. And because if you're a child of God, He's not going to leave you alone about it. Uh, it's going to be like what Jesus told, told Saul. It's not easy to kick against the pricks. You know? <laughs> it, it's, going to be, it's going to be hard. Uh, you know, you might enjoy sin for a season, but there's going to be some repercussions and God's going to uh, chasten you if you belong to Him. And, uh, man, verse 12, he says, Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of, out of the way, but let it rather be healed. When we're chastened of God, amen, we should uh, fight against it. We should, it should humble us. It should humble us and we should show God reverence and saying, Lord, you're right and I'm wrong. And then we can be healed. Once we confess our sins, as the Bible tells us, then He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And secondly, the Bible says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. You know, the law is our vision. Amen? The Word of God is our vision. And, and that's the whole thing. Where there is no vision... You could say where there is no scripture, <laughs> the people perish. Amen. <laughs> and I, I look at households where there is no teaching in the Word of God. You know, there's no upbringing in the Word of God. There's no scripture reading. There's no, uh, you know, teaching the children what the Bible says. And I mean, <laughs> they're perishing. You know, their lives are falling apart. Uh, I could have downloaded all the statistics, you know, off of the computer about teen pregnancy and suicides and, I mean, you name it. But it really comes down to the Word of God because it's the Word of God who quickens. For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And so it is the Word of God that is going to change lives. And where there is no vision, that means people aren't looking for the will of God in their life. They're just living day to day. And they become nihilistic in the sense that life has no meaning anymore. 
because they don't have a vision. And when there's no meaning to life, then a person is capable of doing anything. Uh, people who, who go through uh, such deep depression and such deep, you know, anguish, people who have mental problems, people who have all these problems, it comes from a, a hopelessness, having no hope. Well, in the Word of God is our hope. Yeah. And if we have the Scriptures in our lives, then it's as a vision of, of, of a goal that we are, are living for, then we have hope. We have hope in the Scriptures. We have hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have hope in His resurrection. We have hope in His coming again. If we're just living day to day, then we're going to lose that joy. We're going to lose the peace. We're going to lose the happiness. And just as He says, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Not just keeping the law for our justification, but understanding what the law was for. To bring us unto Christ. And that Christ is he, he's the fulfillment of all the law and prophecy in our lives. That brings true joy and true meaning and true purpose to our lives. Yeah. Look at Amos chapter 8. Amos chapter 8, verse 11 through 13, it says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. In that day shall the fair virgins and young men faint for, their, for thirst. They that swear by the sin of Samaria and say, Thy God, O Dan, liveth, and the manner of the uh, Beersheba liveth, even they shall fall and never rise up again. People don't understand what a famine we're living in. <laughs> in this country, and it's not because of lack of the Word of God. It's because of lack of people uh, reading and, and wanting the Word of God. And man, the famine is real. And it's not a famine for bread. It's not a famine for uh, water. It's a famine for the Word of God. And people are blinded. It's just like Jesus said to uh, the Laodicean church, you know, because you're rich and have all these, this stuff, you don't even realize how naked and blind you are and how destitute you are. And it's because they had gone to a, uh, you know, a mythical way of, of, of religion and, and everything being about feeling and emotion and nothing being about the truth that's in God's Word. Look at Matthew chapter 9. I said mythical, I meant mystical. Matthew chapter 9 and verses 36 to 38 says, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, the, har the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Amen. And that's exactly how... This world is scattered 
like sheep going in all different directions, having no shepherd. But we know who the shepherd is, and we know that he is the answer that this world needs. And so therefore, we need to be in that harvest, amen? We need to be in that harvest, planting and watering the seed of the Word of God, so that we might give hope to those who are hopeless, and light to those who sit in darkness. And the way we do that is to shine the light, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that should be our vision, because that's the vision of God. It's not that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Look at uh, Romans chapter 10. I think this is the vision that many churches have lost. You know, Jesus talked to one of the seven churches and said, you've lost your first love. And I think a lot of churches has, have lost their first love. But it's like Peter said, we can't help but speak the things that we've seen and heard. And he's not saying that we can't help but speak because, you know, God was forcing them to. No, it was we can't help but speak because when you spend time in God's Word and you spend time with God revealing things to you, you want to speak. <laughs> You're excited about telling someone. That's what's, what we've lost in our churches today. Is, oh yeah, people will tell somebody when they have to or they feel coerced to, uh, you know, uh, invite somebody to church or they feel coerced or, or pressured or obligated to tell someone about Jesus or to hand out a gospel tract. But I'm sorry, that's not what God wants, amen? God wants us spending time with Him and His Word that we are so on fire and excited that we can't help but speak. Amen. In other words, we want to tell somebody. We're excited to tell somebody. Amen. We can't wait for that next person to uh, come around and, and, and God open the door so that we can tell them how to be saved. Amen. That's what we're missing. Matthew, I mean Romans 10, verse 13 through 17, he says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Yeah. Amen. We need to preach. <laughs> Why? He says, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When I've studied and I know what the word of God says and I have the answer, I can't wait for that person to ask. Amen. Amen. I'm excited for someone that lies within me. Just as Paul said, and I'm ready to preach to you at Rome also. Because <laughs> I know, <laughs> amen, that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God and the salvation. I'm ready. I'm excited. I want to tell somebody. I can't wait. Listen, that's our vision. That needs to be our passion. Is the gospel. Amen. Answering people's questions. And I'm going to tell you, when you have the answers in the Word of God, you don't want to just sit on it. Right? That's no fun. <laughs> Is it? Is it fun to know the answers and then never do anything with it? No. I want somebody to ask me a question. Because I'm ready to answer them. Amen. 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 I'm ready to show them in the Word of God what it says. Boy, I'm hungry for someone to be hungry for the Word of God. Amen. I tell you what, days get boring when you can't talk about what you live for. And that is the Word of God. For Jesus Christ. 
Sadly, there's a lot of people who don't want to listen and who aren't curious. That doesn't keep me from slipping things in here that here and there. <laughs> right? Hoping that, you know, they'll maybe take a nibble and it might pique their interest and then maybe they'll want some more. Isn't that what Jesus said? Come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Yeah. And we need to throw out that bait. <laughs> we need to throw out the seed. Scatter it everywhere. If it falls by the wayside, it doesn't matter. We just need to get it out there as wherever we can get it. Amen? Amen. Put in that seed whenever we can put it in there. Yeah. Just waiting for an opportunity to tell someone about Jesus. Because if we don't have a vision, guess what? We're perishing. And the law is a schoolmaster to bring people to Christ. Number three, a servant will not be corrected by words. For though he understand, he will not answer. As long as it's a servant... And this is really about more about the master than it is about the servant. Because as long as you treat someone like a servant, they'll do what you tell them to. But they're really not going to learn anything. Dad used to say, and I guess his dad said it to him, you know, I can make you do anything I want you to do, but I'd rather you do it because you love me. And that's true. You know, we, as a parent, I mean, we can make our children do anything we want them to do. But we, we should want to teach them to do what they're supposed to do. Not just make them do what they're supposed to do. Because as long as they're, we treat them like a servant, and that's not just with children, that's with anybody. A boss, as long as they treat their employees just as servants, they might get the job done, but they're not going to get anything more. What did he say? He said, uh, talking about that servant, if he brings him up, see, he that delicately bringeth up his servant from a child shall have him because uh, become his son at length. And that should be the goal. The word delicately means, you know, with thought. You know, I mean with, with compassion. And that's what this world lacks, is, is to have, a, have thought for someone else and compassion for someone else. Not just to treat them as a servant or just treat them as a means to an end, but to treat them with, as a person who has value, as a person who Jesus came and died on the cross for. And when you treat people with compassion and they know that you care about them, whether it's a child or whether it's a person, you're going to win a son. <laughs> Amen. And the Bible says, he that winneth souls is wise. Mm -hmm. Does it start at the home? It sure does. Amen. The people I want to win the most are my own family, my children. Amen. That's why I want to bring them up in the admonition of the Lord. Amen. That's why I correct them when they're needing correction. Because I want them to understand that that law that they're under is going to bring them to an understanding of why they need Jesus Christ. But then it's not just about our families, it's about anyone we can reach. To show them that, that sense of worth that we have for them, that, that value that we have for their soul. People can see that. Hey Amen. People can see a genuineness that someone has for them that they truly care. Yeah. Yeah. A servant will not be corrected by words, for though he understand what you're saying, he will not answer. 
It's just his job to do it. That's why I love this next verse that I want to read. John chapter 15. John chapter 15 and verse 13 through 15. He says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Not just to make someone do what we want them to do, but help them to understand why and what it profits them. I mean, just to know that I should accept Jesus just because that's what I'm supposed to do, that's not good enough, right? I need to know why, that I'm a sinner right. and that it profits me because Jesus Christ paid for my sin. Right. That I might have life eternal. Not just so that my life is, is more at ease. And Jesus said, I don't call you servants. I call you friends. Yeah. And guess what? He laid down his life for us. Yeah. Look at Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4 and verses 1 through 7 it says, Now I say that the heir as long as he is a child differeth nothing from a servant though he be Lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Amen. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Have a Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Amen. Amen. <laughs> when, we were, when we were without Christ, we were under the law, we were servants, man. And that law was there to show us our guilt. A child needs that correction to understand that there's a price to pay. And then they can understand when they're older that Jesus paid the price. Yep. Amen. Amen. Jesus paid the price. Amen. That we don't have to be servants anymore. We can be sons. Amen. Amen. That I'm a child of the King. To as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God. Yeah. Even to them that believe on His name. And then look at Philemon. And we'll be through. Philemon verses 8 through 20 it says and this is Paul interceding for a man named Onesimus who was a servant to someone in this church and had become uh, I guess he had run away from his master and while he was away he met Paul and uh, served Paul and Paul went him to the Lord but he wasn't a servant anymore he was a son yeah. because he, he, he led him to the Lord in the, in, uh, in, through the gospel. So here's Paul's uh, letter that he wrote back to Philemon 
of Adonisimus. And verse 8 says, Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient, yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee, being such an one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I beseech thee for my son in Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me, whom I have sent again. Thou therefore receive him, that it is mine own vows, whom I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. But without thy mind would I do nothing. In other words, because this man was a servant of Philemon and he had run away and escaped, once he was saved, and this is just proof of his salvation, he needed to make things right. And so Paul said, I would have kept him here to minister to me, but I wouldn't do that to you to make things right. That thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season that thou shouldest receive him forever. He says God had a plan in it. Amen. <laughs> that he departed for you, but now he's not just a servant, he's a brother in Christ. Amen. Now not as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, especially to me. But how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Yeah. Amen. And he says, If thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. If he hath wronged thee, or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand, I will repay it. Albeit I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me, even thine own self, besides. Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my vows in the Lord. And so, <laughs> amen. Paul showed that he, he valued people, amen. He showed that he, he valued their, their soul and their life and he cared about them. And he even wrote back, you know, if he's wrong, me, put it on my account. I mean, that shows the, the care that, that Paul had. And that's the same compassion that we need in our life. And because if we show that compassion and we show that we value people and that we show that we truly care, it takes a lot to correct someone and to uh, show them their <laughs> wrongdoing. But at the same time, if we do it because we love them, they're going to know it. And uh, it's going to work in their life. Yeah. And uh, doing all things for the honor and glory of God is what it's about. So that we can bring people to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Let's stand. Lord, we thank you tonight for your word. We just pray that you would use it in our hearts and in our lives. Lord, that we would truly be servants of you, even though you have not made us servants, but Lord, you have made us sons, adopted us. Lord, even though we're not even worthy, but Lord, yet we should choose, Lord, to be your servants. Lord, because you first loved us, Lord, gave yourself and died for our sins. Lord, help us to give our lives to you each day. And Lord, to be that living testimony of your salvation, Lord, to others, that we might teach them, that we might invest in their lives. As we have had those who have invested in our lives, the gospel and your word, Lord, to teach us and to show us and to correct us and to exhort us in the word of faith. Lord, that we might also grow up into Jesus Christ. Lord, to be able to then go out and teach others. Lord, help us not just to sit on what we know, but Lord, to be excited and have our hearts burning on fire 
Lord, with anticipation of being able to show someone else the truth of your word. Yeah. And Lord, forgive us where we fail you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated as we sing, and the altar is open. Page 12. Page 12. Sing all three verses of Blessed Redeemer. Page 12.
Lord, we come to you again tonight. We thank you for all that you have done, even though we're not worthy. We ask the Lord just to keep watching over us this week as we go through the week, Lord, that somebody may see you in us, that we may honor and glorify your name no matter what we're doing. But rather we're working, shopping or out about, walking around, Lord, help somebody see you in us. Let us have answers for them that have questions. Lord, just please put your hand upon us, Lord. Let us use this message that we learned tonight, that we heard tonight in, in our hearts, in our own personal lives. We ask the Lord to still so keep watching over all requests spoken and unspoken, Lord. You know each and every intent of our heart. You know what we need. We ask you, Lord, let your will be done. Keep us in your will and out of your way. For the ones that ain't here tonight, for sickness or whatever, Lord, we ask you, Lord, please put your hand upon their bodies and by them to make it back in the next appointed time. We ask you, Lord, just please uh, keep our missionaries in poor land. We know the American dollar is not what it used to be, but we know that we can do all things through Christ who strengthen us. us. Just put your hand upon us. No matter what we're doing, let somebody see you in us. Amen. And just leave it direct. Amen. Jesus and I are praying. Amen. 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 Elliot, get over there.